Thank you, Nancy. And I'm glad you're joining us wherever you are. And I was gonna say some real sweet things about her, but she said, don't get sappy. So I can't do that. Even though tomorrow is Valentine's Day or when you're watching this, it's Valentine's Day. So uh, thanks again for joining us. Let, let's begin with prayer, all right? Lord, I ask you to. <laughs> Speak to our hearts through your word, through what I share. Lord, I pray that you would help us to open our hearts to what you want to say to us and be willing to do what you lead us to do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, John chapter three. I have officiated at weddings and I have officiated at funerals. Weddings, weddings are wonderful. You have a, a, a biblical wedding. A man and a woman are pledging their lives to one another uh, forever, for the rest of their lives. And after the wedding, you have the reception. It's a big party. It's great. Of course, a funeral is different. It's sad. And it's very, very sad if uh, the person who passed away has had no profession of faith in Christ. That is very sad. But it's also sad if our loved one has gone on to meet with the Lord. And not sad for them, but sad for us because we know we won't see them again uh, in this life. But we rejoice because we know we will see them in the next life. Whether you attend a funeral or a wedding, there should be a time for worship. Now, you probably have not met my son-in-law in New York. Perhaps you have. His name is David, and he married my daughter, Vanessa, several years ago. I was honored when they asked me to officiate at the wedding. After they exchanged their vows, the wedding service took a little different turn. Since David and Vanessa wanted their lives to be a worship offering to the Lord, they wanted to take time to worship. So right after the exchange vows and before the exchange of the rings, the congregation sang, here I am to worship. <laughs> it was beautiful. Many people mentioned later to me, how much it meant to them. That was David's idea. I want to give him credit for it. Although I'm sure he doesn't want the credit. He gives it to the Lord. <laughs> Oh, I have to tell one more story about a wedding my daughter Vanessa attended. I think it was the first wedding she ever attended. Nancy and I and the children drove down to Pennsylvania because my brother-in-law's sister named Lisa was getting married. So we drove down to Pennsylvania and I think Vanessa was about five years old, maybe six, I can't remember for sure. And we sat down in the uh, church and the wedding march began and Lisa began to walk down the aisle with her distinguished looking father, a silver haired gentleman, very fine gentleman. And Vanessa leaned over to me and whispered, she's not gonna marry that old man, is she? <laughs> and uh, no, she didn't. Now, funerals are sad, but there's something I do like about funerals. Consider that at a funeral, many times people are interested in hearing the gospel, the plan of salvation. When people go to a wedding, I'm not sure how many of them want to hear the gospel, the plan of salvation at a wedding. But at funerals, that often happens, and people often come to know the Lord at funerals. Why mention all this? Well, John the Baptist describes himself as a friend of the bridegroom. So first in this passage, we find that John is a friend in ministry to Jesus. Uh, so there was a time when Jesus and John the Baptist were still both ministering at the same time together. John 3.22 says, After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he was spending time with them and baptizing. John also was baptizing in Ainan near Salim, 
because there was much water there and people were coming and were being baptized for John had not yet been thrown into prison. So Jesus was in the land of Judea. John was in Enon or Idon. Where is that? Well, no one knows, but we know it's near Selene. So where is Selene? Well, no one knows, but we know it's close to Enon. Now, we do know it was close to a lot of water, and that's about it. It was probably along the Jordan River. Some think it was halfway from the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea. Jesus was in the land of Judea, but we don't know where for sure, but he probably was not that far away. People were coming to John to receive baptism, and isn't it interesting that people were coming to Jesus for baptism? John 3.22 says, After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he was spending time with them and baptizing. Verse 22 says, Baptisms were taking place under the ministry of Jesus. These were undoubtedly Christian baptisms. Now, the verse seems to indicate Jesus himself was doing the baptizing. One writer said, this verse states explicitly that Jesus himself baptized. It does not imply that Jesus' disciples baptized on his authority. Any attempt to harmonize this verse with John 4, 2 would be unwarranted. I think the person who wrote that is incorrect, and I want to read to you John chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, and explain why. Verse 1 says, John chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. John 4, 1 explicitly says Jesus was baptizing disciples. But verse 2 clarifies the disciples were doing the baptizing. So when John says that Jesus is baptizing in John 3, 22, there's no reason to suggest there's a contradiction. John clarifies in verse two of chapter four, about 15 verses later, that Jesus was not the one baptizing. The great Baptist Greek scholar A.T. Robertson said, Jesus was not personally baptizing, but was baptizing through his disciples. Now, some think that Jesus may have baptized his apostles and they began to baptize others. I don't believe that's the case because John 4, 2 says Jesus did not baptize anyone. Notice that John 3, 23 says John was baptizing where there was a lot of water. Now, I've been in Catholic churches where the baptistry consisted of a bowl of water, a small bowl. It's not big enough in which to dip a baby. Indeed, uh, there's only enough water there to sprinkle a baby or someone who wants to be baptized in the Catholic version. Now, I was just curious one time, I did a little study. If there's a water shortage, can Catholics use something besides water? The answer is no. In response to a water shortage, Pope Gregory IX issued a decree saying it was not valid to baptize someone in beer. I'm glad we got that straightened out. All right. So the point is John needed a place to baptize where there was much water. If baptism only consisted of some sprinkles, why did he need much water? Of course, he needed much water because baptism consists of immersion. Complete submersion. The word baptism means immersion or submersion. If someone puts their faith in Christ, they should be baptized. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus tells his disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, the disciples, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And by the way, that's what we see in this passage the baptisms that are taking place are not baby baptisms. They're believers' baptisms, disciples' baptisms. The Bible nowhere says babies should be baptized. Dedicate your baby to the Lord, yes, 
but don't baptize your baby. So we see Jesus had a friend in ministry with John the Baptist. But John the Baptist's disciples, some of his disciples were not so sure. They wondered if Jesus was actually a foe in ministry. Look at verse 25. Therefore, there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. Now, there were certain rituals of pur purification in the Old Testament. For example, if a priest declared a leper free of leprosy, the leper was, according to Leviticus 14.8, supposed to wash his clothes, shave off all his hair, and bathe in water and be clean. Now, the bathing in water was probably symbolic of being cleansed from leprosy. So some of John's disciples were discussing about water purification and uh, with, a, with a Jew and talking about baptism with him. And, and perhaps this Jew pointed out, Jesus is baptizing more people than John. And he may have asked, why should John baptize me? Also, more people were going to receive baptism than, than were receiving it from John. Look at verse 26 says, all were coming to him. Everyone, everyone was going to Jesus now. Hardly anyone was coming to John. Can you see the jealousy and the envy and the rivalry and the competition behind these words? John's disciples were upset that Jesus, whom John had introduced, was setting up a rival camp a short distance away, probably down the river, and he was winning more people than John was. If preachers are not careful, we can have a secret sin in our life. Uh, it's the sin of being envious of other preachers. Is God using some other preacher? Well, let me put this with uh, those of us who are not preachers, or if you're not a, a preacher. Uh, Christians can also have a sin in their life of being envious of other churches. What if another church is growing faster than your church? How does that make you feel? Do you rejoice for that church? Or do you, uh, do you sec secretly rejoice when a church that's in competition, <clears throat> quote unquote, with your church, if the pastor falls or if they have some type of breakup and split and you start getting people, I hope that doesn't cause you to rejoice. Competition is one of the most dangerous things to enter into the family of God. Satan loves to divide us and make us envious of other believers. We ought to rejoice to see God's blessings on other preachers and other churches. John's disciples were worried. Uh, and I mean true biblical churches when I say that. John's disciples were worried. The crowds that once claimed, uh, came, came to John just flocking to hear him were now going to Jesus to hear him. Be careful. Christians tend to have a little game where we play, we, we like to compare ourselves with others and we like to compare our church with other churches. Uh, we especially like to compare ourselves with someone if it makes us look real good in the process. <laughs> One of my former pastors was named Ron Dunn and Ron once said that his church had baptized about 100 people one year. That's great. And he invited a friend to preach a revival who had baptized 250 people in one year. And during that revival, Ron's friend, Ron friend said to him, you're not on the ball. He was not following God as closely as he should because he only baptized, his church only baptized 100 people, whereas this guy, he baptized 250 in his church. Well, <laughs> Uh, Ron later heard of a church that baptized 478. So he was wanting to call his friend and tell him, you're not getting the job done either. <laughs> Another church baptized 1,000. Uh, the church baptizing 478 was not getting the job. 
done. Another church baptized 3,000. So the church baptized, baptizing 1,000 was not getting the job done. We're not to compare ourselves with each other. If you want to compare yourself to someone, compare yourself to Jesus. Yeah, do that. And if God does something good in your life or in the life of your church, give him the credit. He's the one who deserves the credit and the glory, not us. God's to get the glory. Now, there's a fast food place I like, and most of you know, who know me already know this. Uh, there's a drink I love to get at Sonic. It's called stra Strawberry Limeade. Yes, and in all transparency, Sonic is paying me to advertise for them. <clears throat> well, uh, <laughs> what makes that drink tasty is not the container it comes in. No, the container just holds the drink. It's the one who fills us who makes the difference. Fill my cup, Lord. Uh, he's the one who makes the difference in our lives. Okay, so John's explanation is going to surprise them. No, Jesus was not a foe in ministry. Instead, John was the friend at the marriage. Look at verse 27. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He, he who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard of that he testifies and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Your fellow Christians, your fellow preachers, your fellow churches, they are neither foes nor our competition. If it's a true church, they are partners with us. Now, even if it's a true church, they may not be perfect, and we're not either. John gives three reasons not to be concerned to his disciples about the number of people following Jesus. First, he says, this is God's work. Verse 27, John said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. If God is blessing the ministry of Jesus, that's what God has chosen to do. And by being envious of others, we're only hurting ourselves. Instead, we're to focus on the Lord and seek to bring him glory. By the way, anyone who is talented or gifted uh, should bring glory to God because he's the one who gave them those talents and gifts. Now, if you think for a moment uh, that you deserve the credit for who you are and what you've done in life, I suggest you read the fourth chapter of Daniel, because there's the greatest king of the ancient world. His name was King Nebuchadnezzar, and he struts around in arrogant pride and, and looks around Babylon, and he says, is this not Babylon the great? which I have made. Within weeks, he's out in the pasture eating grass with the cattle, having lost his mind until he learns what he later proclaims. There is a God who, in heaven who lifts men up and puts men down. God alone can exalt one and he can also dethrone one. We all need to learn this. If you're gifted, who gave you the gifts? It's God. John the Baptist knew one's position comes from God. God gave John a role in which he could make great joy, or pardon me, take great joy 
and glorify God, but it was not the Messiah's role. That belonged to Jesus. Now, there is some mystery in all this. It's important what you do with your life, but God is working out his will in your life, and he knows all things. The Apostle Paul put it this way in Philippians 2, verses 12 through 13, when he was writing to the Philippian Christians. He said, uh, God is at work. He said, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. God does not say that we always have to understand him. He calls us to always trust him. So first John says, don't be concerned about Jesus. This is God's work. Here's the second thing John says. John reminded them of his purpose. His purpose, John's purpose, was to prepare people for the coming of the Messiah. So John rejoiced to see people follow Jesus. That was his job, to prepare people to follow Jesus. <laughs> John knew from the very beginning it was not his responsibility to toot his own horn. In John 3, 28, he says, you yourselves are my witnesses that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. John was the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. He was telling his disciples, look to the Lord. All I'm doing is getting other people ready for him. Now think of your favorite television for, uh, show for a moment. They probably begin with some exciting introduction. That's the first clip in the TV show that day. Something really exciting is happening. Now, that's really exciting. So do you want to tape that? And do you want to just keep watching that over and over and over again? No. You want to see what happens next. You, that's the introduction to the show. You want to watch the rest of the show to see what's happening. John was the introduction. Jesus was the show. Okay, third John says, I am filled with joy at what is happening. What's important to John is not that people follow him. He was joyful to see people leave him and follow Jesus. John says, in effect, when I see crowds of people leave me and follow Jesus, I delight in that because Jesus can do for them what I could never do. Jesus is the bridegroom who's come to claim his bride. He's receiving those who believe in him. That's his bride. John is essentially saying, I am the friend of the bridegroom. I'm the best man at the wedding. <laughs> I have a certain role at the marriage, uh, but I rejoice when the bridegroom claims his bride. I kind of chuckle because I want you to imagine for a moment the best man at the wedding getting angry because the bride and the bridegroom are getting all the attention and he's not. <laughs> no, we, we can't imagine uh, that the best man at a wedding do that. If the best man at the wedding is a friend of the groom, he wants the groom and the bridegroom to get all the attention. That's their day, not his. So John is not the bridegroom. He is a friend of the bridegroom. He has a secondary role at the wedding, and John's delighted with it. He says, it fills my heart with joy to see them leaving me and going to Jesus. That's what he's saying. Then he utters that great phrase, which ought to be memorized and echoed by every Christian. He must increase, but I must decrease. Yeah, someone some, once said, <laughs> the German Kaiser, at one time that was the leader of Germany, the Kaiser, loved others' attention so much that he wanted to be the baby at every christening the bridegroom at every wedding, and the corpse at every funeral. Uh, they probably did not say that while the Kaiser was listening. But John says, Jesus must increase. I'm on the way out, and that's fine with me. Can I ask you a personal question? Do you want fulfillment in life? If so, it only comes one way. 
And that is by fully surrendering your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and putting him first in life. Jesus came to give life and give it abundantly. The deluded Muslim terrorist who kills others for the promise of abundant life in the next world or paradise in the next world will be sadly disappointed. He will not find himself in paradise. He will find himself in hell. Only in Jesus do we find fulfillment and abundant life. Now, if you want to spend most of your life trying to find fulfillment some other way, you can do that. But you will not find fulfillment except through Jesus Christ. This short saying from John the Baptist clarifies the way to abundant life. He must increase and I must decrease. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. And the sooner you realize that, the sooner you will be on the road to fulfillment and abundant life. Jesus put it this way to his disciples in Matthew 16, verses 24 through 27. It's, he says to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Now listen to what John says about the bridegroom who has come to claim his bride. Now some may say this was not John the Baptist saying this part. Maybe it was John the Apostle, but it doesn't matter. It's God's inspired word, whoever was saying it. John 3.31. Oh, by the way, the word witness or testimony is often used in the Gospel of John. Because uh, you, you might recall, John bore witness to Jesus. And jo Jesus bore witness to the truth. And this is uh, one of the ways of ascertaining truth is by the word of witnesses. So John is sharing with us over and over about witnesses in the, in the Gospel of John. And he also does that in the book of Revelation. John 3.31 says of Jesus, He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. I can't tell you anything about heaven based on my experience. I've not been there. But Jesus came from heaven. He has all authority and he can tell us whatever we need to know. Uh, he's God. He claimed to be God. And by the way, that's why uh, the Jewish leaders wanted to kill him. They thought he was committing blasphemy. They thought he was lying, but he wasn't committing blasphemy. He wasn't lying. He was truly God. John 3, 32 says, what he has seen and heard of that he testifies and no one receives his testimony. So Jesus was telling his, the truth about what he knew, the truth about God, but by and large, people were not accepting it. The Jewish leaders were rejecting it. Jesus and the Father are one. Don't be foolish like the Jewish leaders and reject the testimony of Jesus. In John 8, 38, Jesus tells the Jews who reject him, I speak the things which I've seen with my father, therefore you also do the things which you heard from your father. Sadly, many will not listen to Jesus today and broad is the path to destruction. And I hope what that does is motivate us to go out and tell people about Jesus because God is working in the hearts of some people and some people will listen when you share about Jesus. John 3.33 says, He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. Have you heard of the expression to seal the deal? It means the bargaining, bargaining has ended. Two parties have come to a firm agreement. And those of us who have trusted Jesus as our savior, the deal has been sealed. And we can tell others 
based on our personal experience with him, through trusting him as our savior, through our study of the word of God, that he is indeed alive. And we can rejoice, we know it in our hearts because we've experienced the truth as we put our faith in him and followed him. Now, this does not mean that we may not have some moments of doubts. Certainly, as Christians, we can have moments of doubt. The Apostle Peter denied our Lord three times. We can have moments of doubt. But God can put the doubts to rest if we go to him. He can put the doubts to rest. John 3.34 says, For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. God the Father sent God the Son into this world, and the Son willingly came, and he willingly went to the cross to die for our sins. God the Son also gives the Spirit to those who believe. God the Holy Spirit, God himself, comes to live within our hearts. His Holy Spirit assures us of the truth. John 3.35 the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Now, we just read uh, not too long ago about John 3, 16. All of you know this verse, for God so loves the world. Are you familiar with this one? The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. And yet, the Father loved us enough to let his son go to the cross for us. And Jesus loved us enough to go to the cross for us. God's love is love that holds nothing back. John 3.36 concludes this chapter. Please listen and don't miss this. He who believes in the son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Sometimes when I'm witnessing to people, I'll, you know, in the course of the discussion, I'll ask them, uh, uh, do, you, do you believe you're going to go to heaven when you die? And they'll say something like, I hope so. I hope so. My dear friend, you can know so. You, can, you don't have to hope so. You can know so. Listen again to verse 36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus, you have eternal life now. And it is by definition eternal, everlasting. You will not lose it. You don't have to hope that you will go to heaven if you have the Son of God in your heart, you can know with certainty that you're going to heaven. You have eternal life now. Believe what God says. As strange as it may seem, <laughs> we sometimes win by losing. Uh, John the Baptist was losing his disciples. They were all going to Jesus, and he was winning in the process because that's what he came for, to lead people to come to Jesus. It seems like our Lord lost as he was hanging on the cross, dying for our sins. But you know, that's the way that he brought the greatest victory that's ever been possible. He died for the sins of all so that all could come to know him and receive his free gift of eternal life, who wanted that free gift. If you've not done so, please let Jesus be your Lord and Savior. Here's uh, something someone said to me long ago. If Jesus is not the Lord of all in our lives, he is not Lord at all in our lives. I would urge you, give your life completely, fully 
to the Lord Jesus. Oh, no, no, no. I want to hang on to this little part of it and do what I want with this part of it. And that's the part you're going to mess up big time. Give him your life fully. If you've not done so, let Jesus be your Lord and Savior. Turn from your sins. The Bible calls that repentance. You say, preacher, I, my sins are powerful. They're so tempting. I just can't quit them. Well, with God's help, you can. Turn from them as best you know how. Put your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and he will help you have victory in your life. Please pray that prayer. Ask him to do that. And then let me know. Contact me on Facebook and let me know. Uh, message me. I'll, I'll be glad <laughs> to message you back. You may be not anywhere close to my church. That's fine. I'll try to find help you find a church close to where you are. Let Jesus be your Lord and Savior. And then, Christian, I would ask you to do this. Make this your goal in life. He must increase but I must decrease. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord, I don't know how you're speaking to hearts as I share this message, but I ask, Lord, that whoever's listening will open their heart to you and say yes to whatever you ask of them. Maybe there's some listening to my voice who've not been baptized since they put their faith in you. I pray they would come to me or uh, another biblical church where the pastor, they could go and, and receive biblical baptism. Uh, maybe someone needs to uh, fully rededicate their life to you. Lord, I pray that if, if that's the case, uh, you would speak to their heart and help them to fully dedicate their life to you. Lord, whatever you're speaking to us about, I pray you would have your way in our hearts. Help us say yes to whatever you want. It's the best decision we'll ever make to say yes to you as our Lord and Savior and to continue to say yes to you every day. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening. I hope to hear from you.